Okay. All right, well, I think we'll start then. So, uh, if you don't know me already, my name's uh, James Watts. Uh, I've been involved in open source since around 2007, 2008. Uh, 2008 is the official time I got involved in open source. Uh, like some people, my contributions were kind of invisible until you really get involved with the community. Um, I don't know, like some, I actually started over on SourceForge uh, before GitHub became a thing. I've been using uh, PHP specifically for the last 10 years. Uh, my other language of choice is uh, JavaScript. Cue laughter now. Um, I've been involved a lot in enterprise PHP development. Uh, so very high scale, uh, very large web applications. Um, and that, that becomes a little disastrous because uh, a lot of people who worked in the enterprise know that the evolution of PHP has been pretty slow, especially in the enterprise space. Uh, so when you come into a large scale application, you tend to find that it's broken up into different layers. They still have big sections of the application running on PHP 4 or some really crazy uh, legacy support from before. So it becomes very ugly. It also becomes a task because you have to juggle that. You have to work out, okay, how do I scale this monolithic application, which is spread across multiple servers, each server with different setups, because that, that legacy has never been pulled forward. Um, I'm a core member of the CakePHP project. I'm also the organizer of CakeFest, so this event. I'm also the team lead uh, at the Cake Development Corporation, also known at Cake D as CakeDC. I am also the author of some specifications. Uh, the most relevant ones are probably the extended uh, hypertext transfer protocol and the documentation markup language. And most recently, like you've heard and you're signing now, uh, I am the co-author of the KPHP2 application cookbook, along with Jorge, who did the basic workshops. There he is at the back. So, there's a reality that we live in. And unfortunately, I'm beginning to feel the hate. <laughs> I think when you grow uh, up in development, uh, you grow as a developer, but you also grow by the experiences you have as a developer. So one of the things that rubs off on you is what other people do when you engage with other people's code, when you engage with projects that you personally haven't written. And this kind of forms your uh, character as a developer and your approach. For example, Chris Hutchins has a really strong hate for other developers. He wants them to test. <laughs> but it is true that uh, when you become uh, an experienced developer, and obviously I'm only experienced as I am now, there are people even more experienced than me. Hopefully, maybe it does a U-turn and you come around again. Uh, you, you grow this cynicism about development. You, you sort of grow a tough skin. And so your approach and your uh, involvement with development sort of comes from that perspective. You look at things very differently than other developers do. And usually with the junior developers, for example, you find somebody jumps into the code, they're really enthusiastic, they want to get something done, uh, they want to do something they probably haven't done before. But then the experienced developer knows that, okay, if I jump into this now, all I'm going to do is have pain down the road. So it's about how you approach things. So this talk's going to be slightly different um, from what I've done before. I want it to be kind of a very opinionated talk. I wanted to sort of just, you know, blurb my thoughts into uh, some slides. Uh, because at my position, directing the, the Kate Development Corporation, I get exposed to a lot of people. So I see a lot of people come by me every day, uh, different uh, profiles of people, so project managers, product managers, uh, developers, uh, project owners who don't understand how to code. And they all have uh, different ways of seeing the world of development. They see different ways of seeing what code means. You know, some see code as the result of what it is, so what you see on the screen. Other people see it as what it is at a technical level. They're more interested in saying, okay, how was your implementation? But one thing I found, and I'm, I'm an inquisitive person, I like to talk to people, I like to ask questions, you know, I like to get into a conversation because that's how you learn. When you, when you get hit with different perspectives, that's when you can extend a little outside your comfort zone and you can learn something new. One thing I find is that the common denominator of knowledge about development is really varied. There isn't like this um, keystone 
to understanding that everybody kind of has. It's like you don't have this guarantee that when you sit next to another developer, they're going to know what a design pattern is. And you've already been through the pain where you've learned what a design pattern is. So you know, oh, they've got that to come. I don't want to sit it down next to them and wait for it to come. You know, I'd rather you know, deal with someone a little bit more experienced. So I wanted to go through some theory of, and this is opinionated, so it's my opinion. If you don't agree, you might be wrong. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's my perspective on things. And you can agree and you cannot agree. And if you don't, then I'd really like to talk about it afterwards. Uh, also, I just wanted to put a little note in that some of this slide does cross over with Raphael Dom's amazing talk that he did yesterday. Uh, so bear with me when I, when I cover the same areas. So the number one shortcut to scale is to write less code. There is no greater shortcut to making an application that is more performant, that is more scalable, that is more easier to develop and to maintain than actually following this ideal. Write less code. Proactively write less code. Now, you need to take this at a wit's end, you need to say, OK, well, you could go like the Perl way and write some crazy stuff on one line that nobody understands. Or you can take the approach that, OK, I'm going to write code, less code, but really understandable code. And this translates over to your database as well. So don't only write less code, but write less queries. So what does writing less code actually mean? What do you achieve when you write less code? You reduce the legacy that you have to maintain. Uh, Raphael was saying yesterday that a code has an expiry date. When you write code, you're going to be coming back to it. So make sure that doesn't hurt, because it will hurt. It introduces fewer edge cases. If you have less code, there's less things that can go wrong. It doesn't change the complexity of the things that can go wrong, but it means there's less things that can go wrong because less is happening. There's less opportunity for human error, because we all make mistakes. If anyone here thinks they can write code without introducing a bug, you are greatly misleading yourself. The development efforts are a lot faster. It's a lot easier to jump into the code because there's less of it. So you can, you can gain an understanding of it really, really quick. There's less, and Chris might hate me for this, uh, there's less code to test and cover. So if you have less code, you write less tests. Or, or if Chris would say, if there's less code, you can write more tests. <laughs> And ultimately, the enjoyment factor increases. The final one here is really, really important. If a developer doesn't like or enjoy what they do, and this more than a developer, if somebody who does a job doesn't enjoy what they do, they don't do it well. You, all of us here have a passion for what we do. But everyone here knows that when you come across some cruddy code, you don't enjoy it. And when you don't enjoy it, you usually jump to, like Raphael says, OK, I'm just going to rewrite this. You know, they're, they're not invented here. Let's just, just go for it. And that's the wrong approach. And the problem is it's affecting your morale. And you're making that decision for the wrong reasons. Cool thing about KPHP is it promotes this. KPHP promotes writing less code. Like many frameworks, it's not just a thing in KPHP. But it promotes writing less code because it's a rapid application development framework. So when you're using KPHP, the framework is already putting you in this position where it, it's already thought up front that you're going to write less code. And you can write less code because it takes less to do something or because you can bake it. So the, the framework can make a lot of assumptions about what you want to do. And a lot of this it achieves through convention over configuration. Uh, is there anyone here who doesn't understand what convention over configuration is? Right, OK, the core. There's that morale soaring. So the number one thing to keep in mind when you're working with KPHP is do not work around the framework. Don't, the framework has a way of doing things. Don't do it another way. A lot of people think, oh, I don't need an auth component. I'll, I'll write my own auth. OK, good luck with that. But then when you want to hook something in later on, what's going to happen? Oh, I needed the auth component. So there's a lot of things in KPHP which are ready, a lot of hooks and a lot of modules which come with the framework which allow you to achieve a lot right out of the box. Take advantage of that. That's why they're there. The framework has that purpose. 
don't, don't be quick to reinvent wheels. You might say, oh, that auth component sucks. KPHP doesn't know how to build an auth component. I can build one much better. Well, you know what? That's a clear indication that you should probably contribute that. Go into the project on GitHub, raise an issue, maybe raise a pull request straight away and say, you know, I think this can be a lot better. A discussion will happen, and maybe it is. Maybe you do have a better idea. Uh, like Larry was saying in his keynote, you know, he's amazed how Jose has completely grown as a developer. Now he's learning things from Jose. So it, it's, a, it's a progression that, you know, if you don't allow people with better ideas to come in, it's not going to improve. It's also important to keep aware, and this is something I've come across a lot, the boredom factor. A lot of people get bored. You get bored as a developer. You want to do cool stuff. I want to do some magic. I want to do uh, some crazy stuff because PHP is a really hacky language. You can do some pretty awesome stuff with it. But you've got to resist that boredom factor. The fact that I want to do something cool doesn't mean that what you're necessarily going to do is going to be good for the, for the project or for the application or, or for your coworkers. So resist that, diet to, that, that desire to hack. Don't hack it. Don't do cool stuff because, uh, well, you know, I've got some free time or, you know, I want to do something cool because I want to enjoy what I'm doing. When you're doing it, always keep it simple. Do not build over complex systems, especially out of boredom. Code is simple until you make it complicated. You're the ones responsible for complicated code. When you come across code that you've written and you don't understand it or you don't know how to work with it, that's your fault. The code was never complicated. The code was the code. But you've overcomplicated, usually unnecessarily, because you want to do something, you want to do something awesome. You say, oh, you know, KPHP doesn't do this or doesn't do that. I'm just going to invent it. If KPHP has a way of doing stuff, just use it. That's how the framework's expecting you to use it. And don't repeat yourself. Uh, KPHP is really good about code reuse. Uh, there are a lot of ways within the framework which allow you to take advantage of that. You have the components, you have behaviors, you have helpers. So use that. Utilize that, that, those areas of the framework to get you know, your code where you need it to be if it needs to be in multiple areas. Do not copy and paste code. I see it way too much. And I mentioned before, with the, uh, usually with junior developers or upcoming developers, you jump into it. Uh, you want to you know, get the code out there. You've got it in your mind. You know, I'm going to do it this way. But design up front. Think about what you're going to do and how you're going to do it before you actually implement. Because it's actually going to save you time and it's going to make it more enjoyable. Because it's, it's a falsy idea that when you're going to do something, it's going to come out great first time. It's not. And usually when you have this hacky idea that you're going to do something really awesome. If it's like a four-hour thing, the first two hours are really awesome. But then those second two hours really suck because you realize you hadn't thought about this, you hadn't thought about that. Suddenly, this starts blowing up, then that starts crashing, and you realize, OK, I hadn't thought about all these possibilities. So focus on your, your business objectives when you're, when you're designing. Focus on what the ultimate objective is of what you're doing. And don't focus on a technical solution. There's the typical people with the hacker mentality where they just want to do something really cool on a technical level. That's not what it's about. You're trying to achieve something. You have a goal. And that goal is usually outside of the area of the, the technical uh, interest. So one way you can write really great code is to treat your code as product. Uh, this is something that I sort of picked up like a few years ago. I worked with someone who was actually a salesman before he was a developer. So he had a real sort of strong um, sales and marketing mentality. And he said that when he wrote code, what he would do is he would write code as if he was packaging up a product that he had to sell to people. When he wrote code, he had to sell it to someone else. Somebody else had to buy that code. They had to buy into the idea of what it is you were doing. They have to believe that what you did was really good, that was possibly better than another product. So if you think about and you treat your code as product, you actually write better code. Because you're, you're thinking as if you're building something that you're going to sell and ship. Uh, command query separation uh, is a really great way to maintain consistency, especially in your model layer. If you separate the actions in your application which are changing the state of your application or your data set from the actions which query it, it allows you to have a really, really clear interface to the internals of your application because you know when something's going to change, and you know when something's going to go, when, when something's going to be brought back or returned to you. 
If you execute a command to return uh, a set of uh, data set, for example, don't make changes to the data set in that process. It's really, really dangerous, especially if you're working in a team because someone else you know, innocently calls that and stuff's getting messed up in the database. Build solid code. These are solid, also known as the first five design principles. Solid guides you as a developer to building really great code. And it's really great code because if other people follow that mindset, it's like design patterns. You sit next to someone, they see what you're doing, and they immediately understand what you're doing. And they can immediately understand and they can contribute with ideas or, or with an improved implementation. And Solid is made up of these five principles, the first one being the single responsibility principle. Uh, this allows you to control the uh, context and the knowledge of classes. So you have a class or you have an object. That object has a responsibility. Don't divert that responsibility to other classes. Don't share it between classes. Have a class which does one thing and does one thing really, really well. The open-closed principle uh, is that when you design your code, your code should be open to extension. So you should build code which is extensible. And there are mindsets here as whether final is good or bad, or whether you go private or you go just protected. And it's closed to modification. So don't allow your code to be modified, because when they do modify it, it's going to do wacky stuff that they didn't expect. So through your schema, through your class schema, define, talk to the person who's using your code, and talk through your code. So show that person, look, this is what I'm expecting to you to do. If this method is private, I'm saying to you, I don't want you using this method. It's an internal method. Let's get used my, by my class. Uh, the Liskov uh, substitution principle. This is also to do with inheritance. So basically, if you have a, uh, a main type of a class, uh, it should be able to be replaced by any subtype of that class. So for example, animal and cat, those should be interreplaceable because they are related. If you do that, you're building an application which is built for the future. Because when that extends, when it becomes more complex, when you have more subtypes and sub-subtypes, all of this can be in, uh, replaced internally in your application. You don't have to start refactoring or, or building out your code again. Uh, the interface uh, segregation principle. Uh, you usually come across these developers who build monolithic classes or monolithic objects. And they say, yeah, this, go to the X object because it does this. Oh, cool. Where'd I do that? The X object. Oh, and this other thing, where'd I do The X object. They build these huge classes. So it's really great as those interfaces get broken out, especially uh, client-specific interfaces, so that when someone comes to build on top of your code, you're not finding that everything's resting on that same base. That okay? become really, really dangerous because when that base starts breaking, it affects literally everything. It's like the root of all evil. And then uh, the dependency inversion principle. This basically pushes you to work more on abstractions than concrete definitions. So this is um, very typical in dependency injection, where you're able to build with something or you're able to in intersect something because it's on a certain interface or it extends a certain abstract class. It allows you to rely upon a schema definition rather than a specific object instance. Get a grasp of your code. This is a, um, it's kind of like the pretext to solid. It's the mindset that allows you to push forward to solid. Uh, it's, uh, when you're working with object-oriented uh, systems like KPHP, uh, KPHP is slightly different because KPHP does have some tight coupling internally in the framework. But that tight coupling is intentional because we don't want to be like the Zen framework where you have to literally you know, build your whole framework and system from scratch. We don't want you to have to put everything together to make it work. We want it to work from day one, and you just tweak things to make it do what you want it to do. So the uh, GRASP analogy is a collection of patterns, uh, and there's, there's some uh, approaches there as well, which allows you to sort of formulate a mindset which, when applied to development, allows you to actually deliver better code because you're thinking a certain way. This is like a, a click between junior developers and senior developers. When you're talking to a senior developer or you're talking to a junior developer, they'll say something that will immediately allow you to understand, okay, so if they said that, they don't know this, they don't know that, and they don't know that. 
So you're going to immediately map out all of the areas of development that they possibly don't understand, and obviously that lowers your morale to working with them. Because you know you're going, to have to, you're going to have to teach a lot. Maybe that's facilitated, which would be great. But you're going to have to engage with someone who isn't really on the same uh, technical level with you. And that's really important, because when you're talking, you need it to be fluid. When you say something, someone needs to get what you're saying. They need to understand. Because when someone understands it from the get-go, they can contribute. They can improve that idea. They can enhance that idea. So these are a bunch of patterns that if you apply them, uh, the strongest here for me is high cohesion and low coupling. Uh, polymorphism uh, does apply to KPHP, but not so much unless you're getting into the actual uh, object building internally. But you need to think about applications which have a very low reliance between the objects in that application, and that those individual objects, they have certain contexts, and those contexts do not rely between objects. So when you have one ob object A and object B, object A should not know too much about object B, and object B should not rely upon the knowledge that's contained in object A. This was also uh, a fundamental of um, Raphael's talk. Don't be stupid when you're coding. There are fundamental anti-patterns and approaches to development which will cause you pain. It will hurt down the road. And you want to avoid this because you want it to be fun. You want to enjoy what you're doing. So don't be stupid. Uh, these practices, um, Raphael always went over, but I'll just go over quickly. Uh, the singleton pattern is a very overly used pattern extremely overused pattern. And this is very similar to the uh, God object or to the monolithic class that I was mentioning before. You want to avoid uh, building things which are a global state because you lose the ability to configure, especially in uh, systems which have a high level of dependency injection. It's very difficult to switch things out. So you want to avoid relying on singleton. You want to rely on instances. Instances are infinitely more powerful. And the argument that KPHP is slow with objects just doesn't, it doesn't go anymore. It doesn't work anymore. That's been annulled completely. Uh, don't tight couple your objects and your application. So make sure that your, um, make sure that your objects are independent, that they're able to act independently, they're able to uh, intersect with other objects without having to know things in a pretext about those other objects. Allow, treat your objects as like islands. Think about them as islands in the ocean. To get from one island to another, you need to know where that island is. You need to know where you can go. Maybe part of the island is a mountain, maybe the other part is a beach. You need to know how you get there. That's typically your I.O. So it's important that you understand that when you build an object, don't build that object thinking about what other objects do. Build objects independently, allow them to act independently, and allow them to do things really, really well. Untestability, Chris hates this. You want to build stuff that is testable. So dependency injection, for example, is really, really important with, with testing. Uh, KPHP, for example, is since uh, 2.0 at least, with PHP unit, uh, dependency injection is really, really supported. So it's important that when you're testing something, you're able to change the objects which are being used because you obviously uh, think it was like Jose was doing in his workshop. You don't want to get emails sent out while you're testing your application. You don't want users thinking, oh, did I just buy something? Uh, Premature op optimization, uh, also known as the root of all evil. Uh, don't optimize an application until it represents its final state. If you try to optimize code which isn't it doesn't resemble what's going to end up in production, you're effectively wasting your time. Because when you come to the final deployment, you come to the final uh, state or the final um, schematic of that code that's going to actually resemble the final application, it could be completely different to what you tested before. You want to profile your application, that's for sure. You want to make sure you're building code that is stable. You want to keep your error log clean at all times during development. Error logs are not permitted during development. And you want to make sure that when you do come to optimize an application, you're optimizing something which is going to represent the final state. Because otherwise, you're, you're literally optimizing nothing. It might get refactored by another developer. Uh, indescriptive uh, naming. Uh, Raphael mentioned you know, naming variables TR. You know, it's just it's ridiculous. Just don't do it. And this, uh, for me, this is something which happens a lot in another programming language, it's not a programming language, but it's uh, CSS, people have this terrible habit of giving horrible CSS class names. 
like really, really terrible. And you end up with like 20 of them in a div, and you have absolutely no idea what they do. You have no idea what's applying what, where you should intersect, which class should I apply something to or remove something from. It's really important that when you're writing code, like I said before, treat your code as product. Think that you're selling it to someone. If you go somewhere and you, you imagine you're selling uh, products and you're going door to door, like with uh, Avon, and you go up to the door, hi, I'm selling this HRTD, and I'm going to give you an MNOP. Slam. You ain't selling that. And duplication, uh, like before. Don't repeat yourself. So keep your code dry. Keep your code focused. Think about uh, your design up front. If you design your code, you're going to avoid this completely because you're going to have a well-designed code base beforehand. And make sure that you make full use of the framework. The framework is there to help. The framework has all of these facilities you can take full advantage of. So don't ignore it and don't work around it. Keep things in context. Uh, the law of uh, the meta or the meter, depending on where you're coming from, uh, is basically the concept of not talking to strangers. This is fundamentally important in applications which have extensive workflows. If you have an application which has a lot of objects, a lot of objects which engage with each other, in KPHP that tends to happen with uh, models. You have a lot of models which interact with each other. Do not allow a model to understand what goes on in another model. Do not deal with model logic from one model in another model. So keep everything well contained so that when you line up or chain an execution between models, there's no possibility that one doesn't know what's happening with the other or one is expecting something that should have come down the road that never came. It's really important, like with the objects, when you keep them in context, they know only what they need to know about themselves. The single responsibility principle. You apply this and I, I guarantee you're gonna enjoy development a lot more. This is something us as uh, KPHP developers get asked, asked a lot. Does it scale? I don't know, but you should definitely ignore all the benchmarks. The benchmarks, especially in the open source community, are bullshit. There are so many ways that you can falsify the effectivity of a framework that it's ridiculous to compare one to another. Mostly that you see these, uh, these terrible benchmarks which say, oh yeah, let's do a, a simple JSON or hello world response, and we'll compare all the frameworks. Yeah, that's great. Like you have benchmarks which apply absolutely no form of caching. Uh, they do nothing up front uh, as far as you know, optimizing the application itself. It's just, oh, this is a fresh install and let's see if it works. That's ridiculous because no one in the real world is ever gonna do that. So you can't benchmark that and you definitely can't compare that. So pay absolutely no attention to it. But what does scale mean? Because when people say, oh, does it scale? Usually they're meaning, is it performant? Does it go fast? Or they're saying, if it grows, is it gonna have growing pains? But scale is lots of things. Uh, data processing. Uh, I, I can't remember who it was I mentioned in a talk that you should try and focus most of your logic. Uh, it was Mark this morning. If you can focus a lot of logic in workers or uh, side processes, uh, whether that be a cron job or whether that be some sort of uh, worker that's happening behind the scenes, something that gets scheduled, move it away from your application. It's going to allow you to scale a lot more. Request concurrency. Uh, this happens on high demand applications. So request con con concurrency is the number of requests an application can accept at any one time. So this is the scale of your web server. Your caching strategy is going to directly affect whether your application can scale or not. Uh, it can, you can have weird situations where uh, disabling caching in some situations works faster than enabling it. It depends upon you know, the product that you're using or, or how that caching can or cannot work. But your caching is going to affect your application a lot. Also the storage engine that you use. Uh, whether you choose Oracle for your gardening blog or you choose MySQL for your hyper-performant uh, e-commerce platform, uh, you need to be sure that whatever you're choosing to build on is ready and prepared for what you need to deliver to your clients or to yourself. But scale also means other things. And these things always get forgotten. Every single person that I talk to when they come through Cape DC, never ever bring this up. Scale is also development effort. If it takes you a long time to grab an application to change something, it doesn't scale. Because if you want to move at a fast pace or you want to develop a huge feature, you're basically going to have to hire a huge team. 
that doesn't scale. That's extremely costly. And maintenance costs. When you build something, you have to maintain it. Again, code has an expiry date. So you want to make sure that whatever you're building doesn't cost more to maintain than it did to actually build, because otherwise, it doesn't scale. So think about your data. Uh, your database schema, if you are a database-driven application, which I think 99% are, your database schema is your Achilles heel. If you get your schema wrong, if you poorly define your models and your data and how that data interacts, you're going to directly affect the effectiveness of your application. If your application has these really whack models, these, these really crazy uh, out-of-par relationships and associations which have nothing to do with reality, you're probably going to face problems down the road because your relationship doesn't reflect reality. You want to make your application a mirror. Mirror the real world. If you have a certain business structure and that business works a certain way, your application and specifically your database st uh, schema should reflect that. It should be a mirror of it. And when you mirror it, you want to make sure that the associations and the relationships also mirror those associations and relationships in real life. Because then when you're talking to someone, whether it be a developer or a product manager, you can easily explain how this code works because they're going to understand. They're going to understand that you have a certain model which does one thing and a certain model does another because they think the same way. They just don't think with code. And think ahead with your data. When you're defining your database, when you're, when you're defining your schema, think how the data's going to interact. Where's it going to be coming from? What sort of data are you going to be pulling from your database? What sort of data are you going to be storing? How are you going to be storing it? How frequent is it going to be pulled from the database? All of this is going to affect the scale of your application. So there are lots of ways that you can improve how your application works, and Mark went over a lot more of these than I'm uh, Use queuing, you can use cron tasks, uh, you can use a concept called data warehousing. Uh, data warehousing is just a fancy word for pre-calculations. So if you have an application which requires certain amounts, don't calculate those on the, on the fly. If you see SQL queries or you see uh, certain setups in your model uh, queries where you're doing some sort of mathematical calculation, think, can I do that beforehand? Could I do that every 24 hours? Could I do that every week and just store it somewhere and then read it then? Because otherwise it's getting executed on every query. And even if it's a silly, just an addition, that addition may be running, uh, I don't know, 100,000 times a minute. You want to cut that down. You don't need it. Um, I'm very involved in the community. So 90% of the time I hear the word Laravel. It's really important to avoid the hype. It is true that people tend to uh, come together around things which are good. Uh, so you see you know, other developers doing stuff, and they seem to be having a really good time, and they're really happy, and they're throwing writing code, but they've got these awesome applications. You need to make sure that when you're making a decision on whether you're going to use A or B, or whether you're going to do something one way, or you're going to do it as another, you always base your choice or your decision on results. If somebody comes to you and says, yeah, that was awesome. I had a really fun time building my application. Don't say, oh, well, I'll do it like that as well. Because first, it might be a lie. Or second, they may have done something which they're making sound a lot more impressive, but it actually wasn't anything. And what you need to do is something pretty impressive. So it's always important that you base whatever you're going to do on results. We can sometimes provide those results as the core of the framework. I know Mark is, has a, an application around there where he's been doing some profiling of uh, K3. And you can do profiling yourself. Just you know, mock up an application with just some basic things that you're going to be doing possibly you know, in a prototype or something. Test it out and see if it really does align with what you're expecting. This has been my biggest gripe for years, like for years. People don't respect us. And we sometimes don't respect ourselves between us. When a developer who is experienced, a senior developer comes to you and says, that is going to take two weeks, and it's going to cost this much of money, this much of money and it's going to require this much effort, don't say, well, how can we do it cheaper? Say, OK, I respect your opinion. You've been doing this for a very long time. If I want a second opinion, I'll get a second opinion, and I'll, I'll compare them and see if I want to make a better choice. But don't run people down, because what we do is we discredit each other. 
It's really important that when a developer comes along, and they've been doing this for like 20 years, if they say something, you don't have to heed their word. You can go and do some you know, research or whatever to see you know, if, if what they said really does match up. But respect the fact that they've been doing this for a very long time. Because if you've been looking at code for 10, 20 years, I can guarantee you know something about code. You've seen it. You've been there. You've been in the trenches. It's hurt. You've seen the pain. You've been working weekends. Uh, like Chris said, you know, he, he lost time with his family. These people have done that, and you need to respect that. And not just between us, but clients who come to us, and they try to beat you down. If you're a freelancer, you know this. They try to beat you down, and no, no, that's too expensive. No, that can't be like that. Just put your foot down and say, no, look, this is what it costs. This is what it takes. If you cut corners, it's going to cost you the same or more money down the line. It makes absolutely no difference. Whatever you save on now will cost you later. So, reduce technical debt. Uh, technical debt is when you're building an application. Uh, sometimes you choose to uh, not do certain things or you choose to do things a different way because it's going to be done quicker or it's going to be done yesterday because everything was for yesterday. But you're going to make sure that uh, whatever you do, whatever um, uh, shortcuts or you're going to take or whatever corners you're going to cut, make sure that those are realistic. So if you have an application uh, which has a login and your application re re requires users to be logged in, don't cut the corners around the login system. Don't cut your corners around the security of the user authentication. That's where you want to be focusing your resources. Because if people don't get logged in, they're not using your application. Maybe you want to cut down your resources on creating silly about pages or privacy policies. Well, privacy policy might, might not be silly. <laughs> However, having said this, budget constraints are real. There is a limitation on the amount of money that, that's available. There is a limitation on the time span which is available. But it's really important that when you do cut corners and you do take shortcuts, that you keep that in mind. When you, when you don't do something, it doesn't just go away. It's sitting there on a list of things to do. When you do something differently, when you cut down the implementation or you um, devalue the implementation, that's there on a list waiting to be done. And it's probably going to bite you in the ass when you have a bug on a Sunday night and somebody's trying to fix it. Who here doesn't use version control? Realistically, is everyone here using version control? There is absolutely no excuse to not use version control. There is none. There's not a magic list somewhere on some obscure web page that's going to say, well, these are the actual reasons why you shouldn't do it. <laughs> there is true value to using version control. It allows you to track what's being done, even if you're a single developer. It gives you a history. It gives you a story of the code. It allows you to understand where changes were made. If you're really agile with Git, you're able to easily revert or you're easily able to switch to a different state in that application. You're able to maintain that state. You're able to keep a history of that state. You're able to consult that state when a client comes and says, hey, you screwed up. Let's look at the Git log. Maybe I didn't. And you've seen everything, and you've heard the horror stories, and you've seen those horrible files on some FTP server with dates on them, and you've seen uh, underscore old and underscore two, and there's the old directory that nobody ever looks in, because when you see a directory called old, you just don't look in it. And, and the amount of people, I mean, I'm gonna, something ridiculous that happened at Cake DC like a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had a client who's building out quite a significant application in the New York area. Uh, they literally came to us and said, no, our version control is that when we're going to modify a file, that person puts up their hand, and nobody else touches that file until they're done. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's <laughs> for real. This is Chris Harch's slide. For me, if I'm going to recommend something, and Chris may agree with this or not, never forgo testing. But if there is a real limitation on your budget or real limitation on the resources, at least have some coverage. So don't say, well, we don't do tests. Say, well, we're going to do some tests. 
we're going to identify the critical areas, and we're going to create a small suite of smoke tests, and that's going to be something that's going to give us some manner of understanding that if our application is stable or not. So always sacrifice the level of coverage, but not the coverage itself. And the cool thing about this is if you have one or two, three or four unit tests, it's possible that when a developer is doing something, they're in a good mood and they'll say, yeah, I'll write some tests. But you usually find when there are no tests, that interest in writing just one plummets. So there's, there's some enthusiasm that, okay, well, there are a few tests. I'm going to add to this suite. I'm going to improve it a little bit. So that is the theory of what I've picked up. And like I said, that's very opinionated. Uh, so maybe you're going to say, no, that's low crap. But then there's also some practice. At KTC specifically, uh, Lubomir yesterday in his lightning talk uh, just gave you a quick introduction to uh, the KTC workflow. Uh, we're going to be releasing an extension for Git that we've written, which uh, greatly improves having to work with that. So you write a lot less code on the uh, console. But when you're working with the KTC uh, Git workflow, it allows you to have a development strategy. So when you're working with developers, you're able to say to the other developers, look, this, this is the process, this is the strategy that we're following. So everybody is aligned and everybody is doing things the same way. And we actually implemented this to improve the quality of the code that we were developing. Uh, when you have a small team and you have a lot of projects, you need to make sure that that coherency uh, isn't a burden. That you're able to say to someone, okay, well, this application is a certain state, it's at a certain point, and we're able to determine, okay, we're going to put more resources on it now. Is it going to go paused? Are we going to freeze? Uh, are we going to move to QA and then maybe hold the next milestone? Uh, it allows you to have a really uh, sane idea as to the position in the project and the state. Uh, one of the cool things also about this is it allows you to do something called multifaceted deployment. So you can actually see the develop branch deployed, the QA branch, the stage branch, and the master branch. So you literally see four versions of the same application. So when somebody comes into a project, you can say, well, let's see Bleeding Edge. Where are you guys at? You can look at the stage of the, of the develop branch. I want to see what's in production now. You can go to the website. I want to see what's coming up to go into production. You can look at stage. Uh, we achieve this process by going through basically permanent branch and temporary branches. Uh, so uh, the develop branch is the bleeding edge branch. Uh, we branch off from that as uh, feature branches. Uh, people do their features. They go back into development. When we consider the milestone to be complete, uh, the develop branch gets merged into QA. There's then a QA process. Uh, QA does not include unit tests. Don't mix up testing with QA. If something needs to be fixed, if something gets identified by QA, it gets uh, branched as an issue branch. It then goes back into QA. When QA verify that the um, testing process can give some sort of guarantee as to the quality of the code, it gets pushed to the stage branch. And the stage branch could accumulate milestones if the uh, client isn't you know, interested in pushing quickly, or you can go from stage to master for every release. And obviously the agility of your deployment you know, can be short milestones, they can be long milestones. Uh, every client has a different approach. And if you're developing and you're not using this plugin, you're doing things very, very wrong. Very, very wrong. Very, 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 very wrong. This plugin will give you introspection into your application beyond your wildest dreams. And beyond that, it has the tools, especially the timers, which, which are incredible if you want to profile your applications, which allow you to know what's going on inside of KPHP. How is my application executing? What is it working with at any point? Uh, what is happening in this certain session of the application? And it allows you to look at absolutely everything that's happening internally. It gives you a nice little toolbar, so it's a nice interface. Thanks to Mark for you know, making that really user-friendly. And it basically makes uh, development suck a little less. Uh, KDC, we have a plugin called the KDC Migrations plugin. Uh, when you're working with code, I mentioned version control. Uh, version control doesn't come into the world of databases. So a lot of people think, well, how do I version my database? Or maybe they never ask that question, which is really terrible. Uh, the KDC Migrations plugin allows you to keep a version control of your schema. So when your database is changing throughout development, you're adding columns, you're changing column types, you're adding tables, it allows you to keep a history of how it's changing. And not only a history, but just like Git, you can revert, you can go up again, you can go down, you can change things, you can add things, and you can then push that to your fellow developers, they run the migrations, and bam, the database is updated. So if you've never checked out the migrations plugin, I definitely uh, recommend that you do. 
Uh, and if you don't understand it, there's a load of people here from KDC, so just reach out to them and they can give you a, a brief loadout. And I just wanted to talk about, I've got some time left. I've actually got 10 more because we started uh, early. Uh, I was just going to talk about some of the plugins that I'm working on because it's my talk. Uh, and um, hopefully, you know, these can uh, somehow add to the ecosystem in, KP uh, in KPHP and allow you to do a little bit more uh, with the framework. Uh, I've had a lot of people over time, especially with you know, the advent of Laravel now, come to me and say, hey, where's dependency injection in KPHP? And I say, uh, it's not. Uh, but it doesn't really need it. I did mention before that you know, KPHP has this kind of internal tight coupling because the framework does enable you to do things without having to do that. The framework is kind of ready for you to just build something and it just works. But some people want a dependency injection. So I wrote a dependency injection plugin. Uh, this allows you to register classes as well as object instances and even callbacks. Uh, it has both constructor and setter injection. Uh, it supports lazy loading. Uh, it has dependency scopes, which is quite important if you want to do dependency injection in different layers. So you want uh, dependency to happen in different uh, scopes of your application. And it also has something called observers. Uh, observers is quite Interesting if you have really, really large scale applications because you can apply your dependency based upon a certain interface or a certain abstract class. And uh, because we all love cake, I built it in a very uh, cakey way. So it's kind of like a utility class. And you can literally add a service really, really easily just by defining the class name. And you can define the class path of where it's going to be uh, injected from. Uh, you can also add an object, as I mentioned. So you can add an instance which is already being created. Uh, and you can also add an uh, anonymous uh, function. You can also add a callable. Uh, the cool thing with anonymous function is you could capture it as a closure. So you can do some pretty cool stuff like that. Uh, constructor and setter injection. Uh, if you're not familiar with dependency injection, there are different ways that you can inject your, your dependencies. The common ways are constructor and setter. There are some others which are quite out there, uh, like property injection. I don't typically like it. Uh, but constructor injection is basically inject injecting a dependency through the constructor of that object. Uh, so this is quite easy, the same as we did before, uh, where we, had our reg we were registering our service on the first uh, code block. Uh, there we just register it and we define the params which are going to be passed to the constructor. The same with a setter, instead of it coming through the constructor, it actually goes through a setter method after instantiation. So this allows you to say, OK, you've now created my object. I now want you to set the dependency. Uh, this is just the same. Uh, you define your setters, because there could be multiple. Uh, you define the uh, name of that setter method. And then you just pass another dependency or just a simple value. And then I mentioned before observers. Um, this allows you to define, OK, I want the dependency to react. So when, I want, uh, when something's going to happen, if I'm going to use a certain object, it will literally listen for a certain class that uh, that object has in its inheritance chain. And if it finds it, it's going to inject something. So this is pretty cool for testing, because you don't have to define anything. You can just say, hey, just observe this. And when it finds it, you get your dependency. Uh, this is a plugin which I've been working on for going on two years now. Um, it's a pretty uh, powerful abstraction of the view layer in KPHP. I literally replaced the whole view layer. Uh, if anyone here has ever come from Java or .NET, uh, where you've worked in an object-orientated view, where you build your interface through objects, uh, this is very similar. Uh, so it's, uh, it changes the, uh, the view. Instead of being a template, it becomes a class. So literally, your view becomes an object itself. Uh, it has an object-oriented design, so no longer is it a procedural template file like it is in KPHP now. Uh, it rel relies upon abstraction and encapsulation, uh, so you're able to work on a, a different level than just defining variables and maybe calling a helper method. You can actually build out methods. You can build whole constructs out of objects. It has a very strong separation of concerns. One of the things I've always hated about helpers is that you end up with methods which actually have H strings of HTML in them. I've never, never liked that. Uh, so this actually promotes a better separation of concerns because each object has its template. So if a designer comes along, you just give them the templates. Developer comes along, you give them the objects. It has an extensible architecture. So the way that CTK imports objects is through factories. Uh, so literally through a factory, you instantiate an object, say a button or a div, 
and then that factory can come from a plugin, so you can then share your factories uh, with your friends, and you can have fun on the weekend. It's plug and play, so literally no configuration. You just put it in, you start using it. And it has legacy support, so everything that worked in CakePHP before, before keeps working. So you still have your layouts, you still have your themes, uh, you still have everything that comes with CakePHP as far as the view layer. So just a little example of how this would work. Uh, instead of creating your template file, which would be your CTP file with the name of the, of the view, you instead you create a class uh, which has the uh, uh, view added to it at the end. Uh, you define some factories. Here you can see that I'm pulling in from CTK the HTML factory and the JavaScript factory. Uh, you then have a build method, which is literally your construct. And then you start building out the, uh, the, the code. So here you're creating a HTML div. Uh, then you're creating a button. You're adding the button to the div. Then you're adding the div to the view. This is quite verbose. Anyone who sees this says, well, I'm not going to do that. I can write four lines of HTML and I'm done. But this is the most verbose example, and you can do a lot of things to cut that down. Now, one thing you can't do very easily with KPHP, you can, but not very easily, is you can't easily extend views. When you extend views, literally what you're doing is something called variable propagation. So you're literally sharing the state of a certain view with a uh, lower extension of that view, and then you can do stuff. Uh, the blocks also support this in, in more of an API uh, facility. So here, for example, if I define an index view, if I wanted my button to be able to be changed in certain views, I can create a base view class. And then in another view, which is practically the same, but the button is different, I can abstract the instantiation of a button way into an, a method, and I simply just overwrite that method, or I call back that method and continue configuring the object. The cool thing here is nothing's been rendered. So when you're actually building your class, there is no HTML. You're working in complete abstraction. Now, it's a little bit more, uh, you need to invest quite a bit more when you're building your views. But when you have huge applications which have, I don't know, something like 200, 300 views, suddenly this starts to make sense. Uh, there is someone here with us, uh, Folk. Uh, he's built quite an extensive uh, admin using CTK. Uh, and he built it in what, uh, what was it, two weeks? Two weeks. So there's my business case. And another cool thing is because this is abstraction, I can do things like binding events. So the event doesn't actually exist yet, but I can bind it to the objects. So here, for example, back with the example with the button, uh, I can create a HTML button, and then I can bind a click event to it. And the JavaScript factory actually comes with CTK, uh, the Cake Toolkit. Uh, so this allows me to define an alert without writing a single line of JavaScript. It's not much, because it's just an alert, but obviously it's a base of what you can do. So you notice that I've created my view. I haven't written a single line of HTML, CSS, or JavaScript. I'm just in PHP. And like I mentioned, the, uh, it does have legacy support. So there's a lot of people who say, yeah, that thing of creating views as a class is just a stupid idea. OK. So if you don't like that, you can actually import the CTK objects into a CTP file. So if, there's, uh, if you want to build out structures, you want to reuse some of the objects that you're building, because you can actually create your own objects, uh, you can just import them using the factory helper. So if you don't like the classes, you can avoid the classes. However, a lot of people said to me, OK, that's really good, but I want to avoid having to write all that object-oriented code. I don't want to do that. I want to do something which is a, a bit more designer-friendly, uh, I want to do something which is uh, more understandable to somebody who doesn't have all of that object-oriented experience, because you do need it if you're going to be building out like that. So I wrote something called the Cake Markup Language. Uh, this is my boredom factor that I was talking about earlier. So the cool thing about the Cake Markup Language is it's based upon an XML syntax. So literally, you're, you're forcing your view to become a read-only view, uh, where in KPHP, it's a procedural PHP file. Uh, I'm now forcing it to be a read-only view. The syntax is immediately familiar, because it literally looks like XML. So it's ready for designers. So if somebody wants to grab your templates and they want to do some design work, they're not going to screw up your PHP, and they're not going to accidentally remove your PHP tags. Uh, they're not going to you know, screw up your, your code or anything. Uh, it's simple templating. So if you want to change the way a certain tag works, or you want to define your own tags, your own elements to use in the, in the markup, you can do that really, really easily. And just like CTK, if you want to import that from a plugin, you can do that too. Uh, it's plug and play. 
So the same again, you just include it in your application and you're ready to go. And it also has legacy support. So everything that worked in your views continues to view, uh, continues to work. So here's some examples of the Kate markup language. Uh, this is a simple just out. So this allows you to control the output to a view. Uh, you're probably going to say, well, why don't I just write hello world? Uh, if you had markup there, it's going to uh, encode your markup. So it, it has strict controls over what's being outputted to the view. You can use variables. So you have view variables that get used in your view as well. Uh, so here, for example, you can see the uh, percentage foo is pulling in a foo uh, view variable. And the hash uh, mundo, which is hello world, if you haven't noticed yet, uh, that's doing a translation. So you can use translations as well. And you can also do things because you now have a markup and you have a template underneath which can do stuff, you can do some pretty cool stuff. So you can say, well, I want to output the value foo, but hey, if there is nothing in value foo, then just put nothing here. And this goes beyond just simple stuff. So you can do control structures as well. Uh, we have a uh, PHP uh, namespace, which is available as well for the markup. So you can do uh, ifs and else, and you can do for eaches as well. And just as before, because there's a template, you can define certain things on the fly to cut down that code. So like with the for each, for example, if there is nothing coming out of that uh, collection in products, you can just say there were no products found. And it's not just simple stuff. It's not just PHP and outputting stuff on the screen. Uh, you can use framework features as well. So there is a, the, in the cake namespace, you can create links really easily. Uh, you've noticed that you can create array structures using the 5.4 array syntax. Uh, you can create forms on the fly uh, with all of the form functionality. So everything that's available in the form and HTML helpers is available uh, through the syntax. Uh, you can import elements. You can import elements which aren't based upon KML. So if you have existing elements, those, those can be reused in a KML view. And you can call custom helpers as well. Uh, that's all I got. And I'm over time. I don't know if there's any quick questions, uh, but I'll just uh, plug. Hmm. Yeah, for example, like in Cake DC, we have a bootstrap factory. Uh, so literally, you can create all your bootstrap stuff just as uh, normal tags. But the really cool thing is, like, if you wanted to find a carousel uh, in bootstrap, that's like, just ridiculous. You've got to create like 12 divs, and you've got to give it certain classes. Uh, with KML, you literally just, it's just one line. I just want a BS carousel. We done? Okay, thank you.